God grant me the serenity to accept things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. This remarkable statement is attributed to a theologian with whose ideas I disagree in every fundamental respect, Reinhold Niebuhr. But, omitting the form of a prayer, i.e., the implication that one's mental-emotional states are a gift from God, that statement is profoundly true, as a summary and a guideline. It names the mental attitude which a rational man must seek to achieve. The statement is beautiful in its eloquent simplicity. But the achievement of that attitude involves philosophy's deepest metaphysical moral issues. Most men spend their lives in futile rebellion against things they cannot change, in passive resignation to things they can, and, never attempting to learn the difference, in chronic guilt and self-doubt on both counts. Observe what philosophical premises are implicit in that advice and are required for an attempt to live up to it. If there are things that a man can change, it means that he possesses the power of choice, i.e., the faculty of volition. If he does not possess it, he can change nothing, including his own actions and characteristics, such as courage or lack of it. If there are things that man cannot change, it means that there are things that cannot be affected by his actions and are not open to his choice. All the countless forms, motions, combinations, and dissolutions of elements within the universe, from a floating speck of dust to the formation of a galaxy to the emergence of life, are caused and determined by the identities of the elements involved. Nature is the metaphysically given i.e., the nature of nature is outside the power of any volition. Man's volition is an attribute of his consciousness, of his rational faculty, and consists in the choice to perceive existence or to evade it, to perceive existence, to discover the characteristics or properties, the identities of the things that exist, means to discover and accept the metaphysically given, only on the basis of this knowledge is man able to learn how the things given in nature can be rearranged to serve his needs, which is his method of survival. The power to rearrange the combinations of natural elements is the only creative power man possesses. It is an enormous and glorious power, and it is the only meaning of the concept creative. Creation does not, and metaphysically cannot, mean the power to bring something into existence out of nothing. Creation means the power to bring into existence an arrangement, or combination, or integration, of natural elements that had not existed before. This is true of any human product, scientific or aesthetic. Man's imagination is nothing more than the ability to rearrange the things he has observed in reality. The best and the briefest identification of man's power in regard to nature is Francis Bacon's Nature to be commanded must be obeyed. In this context, to be commanded means to be made to serve man's purposes. To be obeyed means that they cannot be served unless man discovers the properties of natural elements and uses them accordingly. For example... Two hundred years ago, men would have said that it is impossible to hear a human voice at a distance of 238,000 miles. It is as impossible today as it was then, but if we are able to hear an astronaut's voice coming from the moon, it is by means of the science of electronics, which discovered certain natural phenomena and enabled men to build the kind of equipment that picks up the vibrations of that voice transmits them, and reproduces them on earth. Without this knowledge and this equipment, centuries of wishing, praying, screaming, and foot-stamping would not make a man's voice heard at the distance of ten miles. Today this is implicitly understood and, more or less, accepted in regard to the physical sciences, hence their progress. It is neither understood nor accepted, and is, in fact, 
vociferously denied, in regard to the humanities, the sciences dealing with man, hence their stagnant barbarism. It is the metaphysically given that must be accepted. It cannot be changed. It is the man-made that must never be accepted uncritically. It must be judged, then accepted or rejected, and changed when necessary. Man is not omniscient or infallible. He can make innocent errors through lack of knowledge, or he can lie, cheat, and fake. The man-made may be a product of genius, perceptiveness, ingenuity, or it may be a product of stupidity, deception, malice, evil. One man may be right and everyone else wrong, or vice versa, or any numerical division in between. Nature does not give man any automatic guarantee of the truth of his judgments, and this is a metaphysically given fact which must be accepted. Who, then, is to judge? Each man, to the best of his ability and honesty. What is the standard of judgment? The metaphysically given. The metaphysically given cannot be true or false. It simply is and man determines the truth or falsehood of his judgments by whether they correspond to or contradict the facts of reality. The metaphysically given is, was, will be, and had to be. Nothing made by man had to be. It was made by choice. To rebel against the metaphysically given is to engage in a futile attempt to negate existence. To accept the man-made as beyond challenge is to engage in a successful attempt to negate one's own consciousness. Serenity comes from the ability to say yes to existence. Courage comes from the ability to say no to the wrong choices made by others.